Hi, my name is Julia Silge and I'm a data scientist and software engineer at our studio. And today in this screencast, we are going to use the Data Source Dozen. So this is such a fun data set. It's this week's Tidy Tuesday data set. And the point of this data set is to emphasize how, um, how just um, required how important it is to plot your data to look at your data because um, there's uh, there's actually 13 um, data sets a baker's dozen if you will I suppose um, uh, of example data sets uh, in inside of it uh, that um, have very similar summary statistics but are really different if you plot them in fact there's a dinosaur one of them is a dinosaur and um, what we're gonna do in this data set so this is not an enormous data set it doesn't really give us an opportunity to um, demonstrate how to use really excellent um, practices for a predictive modeling workflow, but it does give us an opportunity to learn a little bit about how random forest models work, like to get some intuition for how they work, and also to show how to train and evaluate um, a, um, a multi-class um, model. So let's get started. Okay, let's learn about the Datasaurus Dozen. Um, I love this um, this data set as a, as a fun one to ex um, explore here. So it is available um, in this package, Datasaurus. And the idea here, Datasaurus Dozen, right here. Um, the idea here is that we have a data set that has three columns. Um, one of them is uh, tells us which data set we're looking at, and then has a whole bunch of X and Y uh, coordinates. And let's let's visualize it right away. So if we take the um, the data set and let's put um, X and Y, and let's color by the data set, and then let's um, let's make points. And um, we're not going to need the legend. And then let's um, facet wrap. Um, and let's, we're going to facet by that data set. And if we do, um, let's do like five, I think. And if we look at what we have here, this is a set of, you'll notice, it's actually 13 um, data sets that um, are, are, have these very um, specific um, uh, characteristics in these X and Y spaces. So it's, it's called the data source dozen because it's actually a dozen data sets plus a dinosaur. <laughs> so um, the idea, so if you're familiar with Anscombe's quartet, um, where it, which is this uh, set of four data sets that have um, the same mean, the same de uh, standard deviation, and the same correlation as each other. But if you look at them, if you plot them, they look really different. This is like a um, uh, this is like that, but more so, but but more extreme. Where um, where these. Um, this dozen, but Baker's dozen, I guess, of data sets have the same, um, they have about the same mean and um, standard deviation and X and Y and about the same correlation. But if, if we plot them, they're very different from each other, right? Like one is a star, you know, they have these very different, um, you know, vertical and horizontal characteristics. Um, you know, we've got circles, we've got dots, and of course, we've got our dinosaur here. So um, this is uh, the the point of this set of data sets is to emphasize how important exploratory data analysis is, how important it is to visualize your data, you know, which is of course huge, a huge point. I I always want to make, especially in the character in the um, in the context of uh, fitting and training um, machine learning models. Um, so let's um, let's do let's show how to get that um, the mean and the correlation and everything. So if we take that uh, data set and if we group by data set here. And then um, we're going to summarize. And I think we can do, we can use that new um, across function 
in dplyr, or relatively new, to apply the same transformation to multiple columns. And we're going to do it like um, this, where we name the, um, the uh, functions that we're going to use. So we say across, and then the first thing we do is we, we send in the columns that we want. So we can put it in a little vector like this. So across the, um, the um, x and y, then we'll put in a list of mean and standard deviation, just like that there. And so here we have the x mean the y, the x mean, the x standard deviation, the y mean, the y standard deviation. And those are, look how they're all the same. So if you were not visualizing your data and just looking at mean and standard deviation, see how that would be the same. And then we can go in here and we can add, let's say x, y, core, and we can find the correlation of x and y. And it's also so similar, right? It's so similar across of these. So these kind of summary statistics don't give us a um, full picture of what's going on. They do what they're supposed to, they do what they're meant to, but they don't, for example, tell us that this one has a dinosaur, um, you know, that, that this one is uh, dots that are very close together and so forth. Um, so what are we going to do? So uh, what, what am I going to do here? Um, I really liked um, using these Heidi Tuesday data sets as ways to talk about um, uh, modeling. There are um, an equal number of points in each one of these um, data sets here. So what I want to do is I want to, um, as I've set up here, um, build a model to, for any one of these um, points, predict which member of the dozen each point belongs to. So this is, um, there's not a ton of data here, um, but I want, so what I just want to do is show like how, um, uh, how, what, how good of results can we get with just some uh, sort of reasonable defaults? Um, if we if we look at this plot that we have, um, there's complex. Um, interactions between X and Y that are related to the outcome. So the outcome here is, is does this point belong to bullseye or does it belong to dots or to star or to X shape? And uh, a kind of model that is often good for modeling these kinds of complex interactions is our um, tree-based models. Like a, and a random forest tends to do a good job of not overfitting without a lot of tuning and is um, you know kind of a, a good a good model for um, not for, for being pretty robust no matter what you throw at it so that's what we're gonna try to do we don't have a ton of data here so instead of um, instead of dividing into testing and training and having an estimate at the end for how I would expect um, to predict on new data. Instead, I'm going to use um, resampling here to uh, instead get an idea of how things are going to act, like like how good of a job can I do here. So I'm just going to take my this data set, the Datasaurus dozen, and I am going to um, uh, I am going to uh, do bootstrap boot strap resamples here uh you know i'm gonna what the, so it there's only three columns and i'm gonna predict this one data set from x and y uh, I, this is going to be a classification model but a multi-class classification model there there's um how many there's 13 13 classes that we're going to try to predict here which um you know is not going to go so well for us when we only have this much data. Or I'm going, to, I'm going to try to use it to show which ones are harder and easier to find and how do we use metrics to be able to find that. So this is, you know, we're using this data set as a way to see how would we go about doing this, which ones are harder and easier to find, what do random forests do. This isn't a data set where I'm going in expecting to have really great performance, but instead one where we can learn a little bit about um, uh, how random forests work. So we're going to predict these 13 classes to predict them we actually need them to be a factor so let's um, let's mutate data set equals factor data set like that and let's um, let's call this dino folds like so 
All right, so we've got 25 bootstrap resamples, and um, these will be the ones, so we're gonna fit to these and um, assess on these. So this is like a, um, like a training set and this is like a testing set. So we're gonna go and do this a whole bunch of times because, because um, this is not a very big data set and so we really want to, um, do, especially for 13 classes, so we wanna go through and do this this way so we can get a good idea of what we wanna do. So next, let's get this model ready. So I am going to, um, let's, so we use the random forest parsnip um, a specification. Let's just make sure we have enough, if we have enough trees, we don't have to worry too much in most situations about training um, or in tuning the um, rest of the model parameters usually. Then we're going to um, make a classification model and let's use um, Ranger. Let's call this our model specification. And then let us uh, build a model, model workflow. So we start with an empty workflow and then let's add a model, which is this specification. And then we need to add a preprocessor. So here, let's just use a formula because we're, we're not gonna do any preprocessing to this at all. It's, you know, it's very um, limited and, you know, straightforward. We are just going to predict data set from X plus Y. That's all we're doing. We're gonna predict what is it? Is it the star? Is it the dots? Is it the dinosaur from X and Y? So that's what we're gonna do. So let's call this, um, Dino workflow, like so. And what does it look like? So we've got a preprocessor, we've got a model, and this is ready to go. And now let's um, fit this to the resamples. So we'll use the function fit resamples, and we will fit the workflow, uh, the resamples that we will fit to are these folds we made. And then let's um, save the prediction so that we can do whatever kind of um, whatever kind of uh, evaluation afterwards that we want to. And let us go. Let's let this do this. Oh, I didn't set it to do it in parallel processing. Oh, I wonder if I should stop it. Let's. So it's not a very big data set. You know what? Is it going to finish? Let's. Let's stop it. Yeah, I know, okay, there we go. Okay, let's try that again. And do that again, and set, do it with parallel processing. And let this go. So this is not a very big data set. Um, we are fitting, um, so in each of these 25 bootstrap resamples, we are fitting, um, to the um, analysis set, and then we're going. It's going to evaluate on the um, on the assessment set. Um, so we don't have a ton of um, like a, a ton of data relative to all the classes here. So we're not we're not going back, and we're not going to have a very unbiased estimate of how this will perform on new data because we don't have a testing set. So in, we're not looking to do that in this walkthrough. Instead, we're gonna just kind of looking to understand what's going on in the various um, uh, classes, which fortunately are balanced in this case because it's, of course, made to do that. So let's see what we have here. So this is um, the resampling results that we have here. So we've got predictions over here. And let's now go on and evaluate our model. So the first thing we can do is we can look at the metrics. So these are the metrics that were computed as the um, as the models were um, as the models were going along. So we've got an accuracy which has been adjusted for the multi-class case. Notice it is not it is not high. That is not a high um, accuracy. It is when you start um, doing a multi-class problem, it is much harder to get all of them right. So you're, you're comparing, instead of comparing one class to another, you're comparing, in this case, we're comparing one class to 12. So we have to get it right um, in all of those cases. And so it's a much harder problem. Getting good accuracy in multi-class problems is much more difficult. And then this is the ROC, which is um, 
again, has been adjusted for the multi-class case um, via this, um, uh, this estimator. And we see that that is, um, uh, the, because of the way that that multi-class adjustment uh, happens, that number looks much better. But that's be just because of like how accuracy and ROC are adjusted. So let's um, let's look at the ROC there so that we can start to see some uh, some visualizations of what it is that's going on. Um, actually, before we do that, let's look at another um, metric because we have. We have all the predictions, so we can do any um, any metric we want. So if we do, di let's look at the results. Let's collect the predictions. So this reshapes, this extracts and reshapes these predictions that are in this um, in this variable. It gets them out in this way. So now we have the predicted probability for all these different classes, the predicted class and the real class. And we can then, um, we can do, for example, positive predicted value, did, like um, uh, how, how good a job did it do in identifying the right case. So data set, um, so that's the, that is the, um, that's this here. What was the real value? And then predicted class, predicted class here. So that is, um, uh, uh, what was what was the predicted class of all of these ones that we have here? And so again, we see this. This is what's tough. It's having a hard time um, identifying correctly overall over all of these um, over all of these uh, classes, getting them right. If we want, we can group by the um, the resample and see how much it varies so that we can kind of get an idea there and we can see you know how much it goes up and down and this this is a data set where you know the sample size especially relative to the number of classes is not enormous so it this is a good thing to look at in this case okay let's um so this is positive predictive value this is accuracy let's look at those roc um, curves. Let's look at some ROC curves and talk about how to get them and what it means to look at ROC curves when we have um, multiple, when we have a multi-class problem. So we do the same thing as this here, and then we do we call the function ROC curve. And what do we pass in? We pass in the true value. Whoops. The true value is data set. And then we, let me just show you again what this looks like. We pass in all of the predicted probabilities, all of these, all 13 of them. So um, we can do it with um, predicted, that is the way, remember that was that one that um, they were kind of away from the center, all the way through to the last one, which is predicted predicted X shape like this. So this, if we do this, um, it's going to compute ROC curves for all of these, for all of these, um, all of these different classes. And um, so that is, so there it is, and it's grouped by I, the resample so that we have all of them. We can understand how, how oops, uh, we can understand how much they vary, resample to resample. And we can plot this because this, of course, is something that's better to see visually than to look at a top of a plot here. And let's take a look. Let's make this big. Okay. Oh, this is so interesting. Look how different they are. Look how different they are. First of all, the dots. The random forest model could find those dots so easily. Remember, random forests are good at um, uh, learning interactions, complex interactions, and it could find those dots really well. It could find the vertical lines really well. Look how great that is. Interestingly, the horizontal lines are good, but not as good. And then things start to get a little worse. And wow, look at the dino. It is <laughs> very different. 
difficult to find the dinosaur. Um, I, this model, uh, is, I think that's the worst one, actually. So it has a very difficult time finding the dinosaur. It's like barely better than guessing in terms of finding the dinosaur. So the, um, the accuracy, uh, or uh, the compute, let's call it the predictive power of the model as measured here by um, area under the curve of the ROC curve, um, it varies a ton from class to class. And th that's actually often true when it comes to multi-class problems, that your model does a, t a lot better identifying some of the cases than the others because, um, because of the way the model works combined with the characteristics of the data that we have there. That is super interesting. It's also kind of interesting seeing the shapes of these, how the thresholding works. Love it, love it, love it. Okay, um, let's look at um, a confusion matrix. So let's go back to this. We again collect the predictions, which like reshapes. I probably should have saved that off. Um, and let's do a confusion matrix. What we do is we do the truth and then the predicted cl class. Nope, predicted class like so. And let's look at this. So this is, if we wanna see the whole thing, we would have to really stretch this out even more, okay. So here's a confusion matrix. Um, just with numbers. We've got 13 classes, so it's hard to absorb this by looking at numbers. Oh, also, um, I I'm just putting all the um, resamples together here. It might be better to filter down to one, but the numbers are so low. I think I'm just going to put them all together here. That would be something to use your judgment on. There is also a um, uh, confusion matrix resampled. Uh, oh, let's see. So I think I take out this. Oh, I don't know. I'm doing something wrong here. Um, anyway, let's just go back to this. So there is a function for doing it with resampled, um, uh, uh, a conf um, conf uh, resampled confusion matrix. But let's just look at it all together because this is a little bit of an unusual case, the way we're dealing with our data. Not what, not strictly best practices because we're not, um, uh, we're, we're, try we're, doing, we're using this in a more exploratory fa fashion to learn about it rather than build the best possible model. Um, okay, so there's, you know, some of these numbers are really high um, that are on the diagonal. Let's, um, let's use, Let's use um, visualization to be able to um, see this a little better. Whoops. Let's zoom in here. Okay, so the um, so what's on the diagonal here is correct. Cla correct predictions, correct classifications. So we see here that the dots, um, the dots were, you know, much easier to predict. The vertical lines, much easier to predict. The horizontal lines. And then we see, you know, the uh, the other things are much more difficult. It like dramatically, you know, like the, the ratio here is of say the dots to the dinosaur in the correct, like that's, that's a factor of 10, you know? So we see really big differences in how well our model does class to class. We can also see kind of the off diagonals. You know, it might be easier just to do, let's, um, let's filter just so we can see it a little better. Um, so what we just looked at was super like important and a good way to look at it, but let's also just, um, take out the correct ones just to be able to see the off diagonals a little better. So I've just set them to zero as a visualization tool so that we can see, so we can, you know, visually highlight what else is going on here. So these are now, we're now, we're now using the, um, the color here to highlight things that are wrong. So what things are most wrong. Before we were kind of highlighting what things were, you know, most, we were seeing the things that were right. Now we're seeing which things were most wrong. So I notice that there's in this, so the truth is on the x-axis. Notice that the, uh, along the dino, column here, there's a lot of dark color because 
it was very difficult for the um, model to identify the dino. And it and the dino was confused with many things, slant up, slant down, the bullseye, the wide line. So, there were, so it was easy to confuse the dino with lots of other things. Um, uh, high lines and circle was was also easy to confuse and away and wide line so what this is showing us is like which things were easy to confuse and it's really great to see here that those are things that you know to my human um understanding it, you know it makes sense to me i the dino one you know that's it's my my own human pattern recognition is so um you know uh, sees the dinosaur so easily that it's it's harder for me to to maybe I, maybe that surprised me a little more than it would have otherwise. But I but I you know I I can understand it and I can buy it that the dinosaur is much harder for the random forest to find than some of these other things. So it's really interesting to notice which which um, patterns are confused for each other and which ones of course were um, are are easier to see notice that you know again we see the, the the dots column is so light all the way through because um, it was um, only rarely confused for something else because the random forest had such a um, such an easy time identifying that that was that all right. So, um, like I said at the beginning, uh, this this data set has very few examples per class. So this wouldn't be, you know, you wouldn't want to do everything exactly the way I did did it in this data set for a real world example. For example, notice that I did not do a tra training training and testing split of the data, um, but um, some of the things that we could gain from this. Uh, uh, the screencast are um, really, uh, you know, looking at uh, what do we do when we need to evaluate a multi-class um, um, model. And also, I think it's really actually pretty helpful for understanding um, what do, what's going on when we train a, a random forest model and what does it what does it do when we want to um, uh, when we want to like learn about those complex interactions that random forests are so good at learning. So I hope this was helpful. Um, even though it's a bit of an unusual data set for a modeling here, and I will hope to see you next time.